Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Janet Gatlin. I am the Director of Outreach with Rogers Behavioral Health, and today I will be your moderator of today's webinar. Joining me today is Dr. Josh Nadeau, Clean, Senior Clinical Director for Rogers Outpatient Services, along with Dr. Jerry Halverson, Senior Physician Executive. Today, our presentation will talk about involving parents and caregivers in treatment. Such an important topic today. Before we get started, I wanna go over some logistics that we're going to have today. I wanna to give our, our quick uh, presenters an over, I wanna give the audience a quick overview of our format. The webinar is going to be scheduled for 90 minutes. To receive the CE credits, you're going to must be logged into the webinar for the entire program today. There's no need to check in via chat. Your attendance is going to be tracked via the Zoom login records and a PDF of the PowerPoint slides and a list of references will be available immediately after the program. They will be uh, emailed to you and with a link for your personal dashboard on cego.com. In addition, a recording of this webinar will be published on the, on the resources section of our website in, in order for you to rewatch it in a, in, a, in a day or two at rogersbh.org. Our speakers will give a presentation today, roughly around 70 to 75 minutes. Following today's presentation, there's going to be a 70, uh, there's going to be a Q&A, which I will facilitate. Uh, you will note that we were gonna have a deactivation of the chat feature in today's webinar. We found that sometimes this chat feature can be distracting for our presenters and other participants, but we are going to um, have, if you will have any questions that you'd like to ask any of the presenters or speakers, um, please use the Q&A button, not the chat feature, uh, to send me a message personally, and we can make sure that as many questions as, as we have time for that allow that these questions will get answered towards the end. At the bottom of your screen, you can simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your task bar. I will review the questions submitted, and then the presenters will have time to answer or address again, as many of the questions as possible at the end of the portion of the webinar. Finally, we have enabled the closed caption for this program. At the bottom, you'll find your screen. You'll find that there's a live uh, transaction button from the menu. You can click the show subtitles to view audio as text if you choose. If you'd like to disable the subtitles, please click hide subtitles from the live transcription menu. At this time, now I'm going to turn it over to my presenters, Dr. Halverson and Dr. Nadeau. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Hello, everyone. Um, before we get started, just a few disclosures. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that myself and Dr. Halverson, uh, we've each declared that we don't have, nor do our families have, any financial relationship in any amount occurring within the last calendar year with a commercial interest whose products or services are discussed in the presentation. Um, in addition, we don't have any relevant non-financial relationships. And last but certainly not least, the folks who have helped us with planning and designing this presentation also do not have any financial relationship. In terms of the presentation today, what we're going to cover, uh, some, some things that we'd like you to be able to walk away um, being able to do. The first is we want you to be able to list at least three different barriers to family involvement that are common to intensive treatment. The second, we want you to be able to describe at least two techniques for addressing some of those common barriers to family involvement and treatment. And last, we'd like you to be able to identify at least two team-based techniques to address and overcome some of the issues with medication management that may arise in intensive treatment. In terms of the specific things that we will address today, um, first, you're going to listen to me uh, warm up the crowd a little bit by talking about some of the research basis and rationale for involving parents, caregivers, and other family members in treatment. Some of the barriers that we run into that are common, not only in treatment overall, but also that are unique to the intensive treatment environment or higher levels of care and some team-based techniques to address and overcome those barriers. Um, then I will turn it over to the rock star, Dr. Halverson, who's gonna talk a little bit about some of the benefits that our individuals and families seeking treatment here can experience that are specific to the intensive treatment models. He'll talk about medication management issues related to our patients' families and some of the family dynamics that we see. And last, team-based techniques for addressing and overcoming medication management issues. And then as Janet mentioned, we'll wrap up with a few minutes to discuss uh, questions that may have come up and we'll do our best to provide answers to those questions. 
So as promised, you're going to get a chance to hear me talk a little bit about whether we're talking about individuals or teams when it comes to specifically intensive treatment. I'm not going to make this a research heavy presentation, but I do want to cover a, a little bit of the research that goes into this in terms of talking about involving families in intervention and treatment. Um, this quote from Dr. Carr uh, actually cut home to me mainly because it made me feel really old when he said that it's noteworthy that as far back as the 1970s, which seems like it was only 10 years ago, um, there have been promising reviews of evidence base for couples and family therapy. Um, when we look a little bit deeper and we look at some of the meta-analyses that have been done, taking a look at the efficacy and effectiveness of involving the what, what's called systemic treatment or family-based therapies, we see effect sizes ranging from 0.46 to 0.65 for family therapy. If you snoozed through stats class, when we talk about effect sizes, 0.46 to 0.65 ranges anywhere from low to moderate in terms of effect size, which means that there is a meaningful clinical um, difference between um, interventions that involve and do not involve uh, systemic therapy. The other piece that comes out of the, the literature that's a little bit uh, more subtle, but certainly interesting and relevant, is that when we use these systemic approaches to treatment, they tend to be more cost effective than individual methods. Um, and that includes the indirect medical cost offsets. Specifically, one of the things we look at is that if you if you think about this, the sheer number of appointments that you're talking about and sheer number of providers, it ends up being more cost effective to lump them all together under one roof or to minimize the, the number of uh, locations that you're talking about. And this is not new um, for those of you who are familiar with things like the medical uh, the medical family home, sometimes it's called or the medical patient home. This is, is not a new development, but it is something to keep in mind. When we start looking at the rationale behind using it, so not so much whether it's effective or whether it's cost effective, but why might we use this? Um, again, we, we come back to this time a, a, a different study that comes out where we see that when we're talking about family therapy, the emphasis here isn't upon dysfunction. It isn't upon what families are doing wrong or how they're contributing to the problem. But what we're really trying to take a look at is how do patients, their families, their loved ones, how do they actually conceptualize what's going on that we define as a problem? And what meaning do they give this problem in terms of the narratives as far as how do they talk about it? How do they deal with it? How do they not talk about it and deal with it? And how does it tend to impair or impede them on a day-to-day -day basis? And what we find is that as we begin to include this piece in, in our interventions, some of the benefits that come out of this here, I'm not going to read the list, but a, a few to keep in mind is the first, it, it does a, a wonders for us in terms of being able to build a strategic therapeutic alliance, not only with the patients or clients, but their families as well. It also gives us access to information that's devilishly hard to find if you're not using a systemic approach. Uh, I haven't found a rating scale yet uh, that we send to parents and then get back that tells us uh, meaningful information about the dynamic in terms of how parents are, are not only interacting with the child that we're seeing for treatment, but that child's siblings, other family members, other people in the community. And so it, it becomes very hard for us to get a bead on exactly what that communication dynamic is like and what some of the other issues and strengths that families bring to bear. In the interest of looking at things like um, inclusion um, and, and kind of paying some respect and being more aware of the diversity that we see in the families who come to us, it's really important for us to involve the family as, as much as we possibly can with that respect as well. So in terms of strategies that we use, uh, I think a lot of folks, particularly when we're talking about behavioral health, will, will focus or limit themselves to behavior change itself. Um, but here, what we're really looking at is the, the inclusion of the systemic therapy approach um, specific to, uh, to family therapy. What we're looking at is that the more that we involve families in this, not only are we looking at behavior change, but again, we're getting a closer look at what these behaviors mean, the functions that they serve. Um, trying to take a look at where people's skill levels are in the family when it comes to things like communication and problem solving, when things get difficult, as they often do when there are mental health struggles in the household, how are we responding to those situations? Um, is there positive reinforcement being uh, delivered? And if so, how? How often? What's the balance between positive reinforcement and maybe more punishment-related um, activities or responses to that? 
And then when we're looking at parents or other family members, how do they cope with their own anxiety responses? So not only do we see the, the resistance that's mentioned here too, but oftentimes, again, we start to see those secondary emotions come to the forefront, where when I'm anxious or worried about how my child is doing on their mental health journey, instead of that coming out as I'm very anxious about how you're doing on your mental health journey, it may come out in terms of anger, uh, it can come out in, a, in any number of maladaptive ways. And again, unless we involve the families in treatment, we will not see that. So fantastic, right? Uh, so we've got this great evidence base that goes back as far as the 1970s again, uh, to show the effectiveness of this. We see that it's particularly useful to us when we're talking about youth who who have been resistant or that, that lovely term refractory that we use to, to talk about um, a lack of response or a lack of uh, durable response to treatment. So why do we not typically use it in our approaches as a as sort of a default treatment element? Why isn't it just coming you know, right off the shelf in, any, in terms of any intervention that we use? Why are we not including families in this? So this brings us to things about barriers to implementation. I won't say the most meaningful, but, but oftentimes one of the biggest barriers that we run into is that most healthcare facilities don't offer it because it's not seen as being profitable. So when we, when we think about cost-effective versus profit margin, those are, those are really two different things. And so a large barrier for us is how do we get facilities to see these as meaningful and essentially worth the investment that has to be made in those strategies. Um, sort of along the same lines here, when we talk about family visits, oftentimes they're not reimbursable. If they are reimbursable, they're certainly not reimbursable at a rate that's seen as coming anywhere close to reimbursing us for the amount of resources that are being um, provided in that time. Specifically, when we're talking about family therapy or systemic therapy, it usually includes at least two therapists. And the duration of those sessions is much longer than the typical hour that, uh, that you would normally seek reimbursement for. It can run anywhere from one and a half to two hours. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the therapeutic work that's actually occurring in family sessions or in family therapy is occurring outside of the meetings with the parents which makes sense when we're talking about cognitive behavioral techniques or skill building techniques, where the majority of the, the therapeutic work, if you will, is happening in terms of when parents or family members begin to practice those skills that are being taught in the sessions. Cross-training is incredibly rare among providers. So um, although it's been around since the 70s, still what we tend to find are the providers who are well-versed or trained pretty heavily in family therapy may not be as well versed in terms of the individual therapy or the CBT technique or with whatever type of approach is being used in the practice that, that we're talking about here. And vice versa, the folks who tend to be the most well trained in terms of those um, specific patient or client facing roles may not have much training background or competency when it comes to actual family work as well. Um, don't forget, so, so you'll notice the bullet points that we're talking about here they shouldn't appear new to you. These should not be a surprise. Um, these are not limited to higher levels of care. They're, they're relevant in whatever level of care we're talking about. As we start to look at the higher levels of care, so specifically when we start using insurance terms to talk about things like intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization or day treatment programming, residential levels of programming up through uh, inpatient care, there's some additional barriers that we talk about. So, um, and, I, and I don't wanna sell Rogers, that's not the point of this presentation, but I'll, I'll point out to you that we have 21 different outpatient sites uh, across the country, which is, may not sound like a lot to you, but it's enormous. So we're, we're one of the largest unaffiliated non-for-profit behavioral health care centers in America. And yet, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but my sense would be somewhere between a quarter and a third of the patients that we see have to relocate geographically, sometimes a considerable distance in order to be able to attend our services. So when we, when we kind of think about the travel time that comes into this, the cost that's associated, the uprooting of the entire family routine that occurs. Um, so again, talking about the family, it's possible that we're talking about dividing the family up, especially when the patient or client is not the only child in the family. So there's this sort of division, not only of parental responsibilities, but of having to functionally operate in two different households at once or more. Um, what we like to call the fishbowl effect. Um, so if much of what we're trying to change has to do with the dynamic that exists in the home environment, we do our best to create an analog of that home environment in the treatment setting, 
um, but but results may vary depending upon kind of what type of background we're talking about what the what are the cultural implications when we talk about the family who does that involve when we talk about the home what does that look like are we talking about one household multiple households when we talk about parent or caregiver how many are present all these questions come to the forefront and despite our best efforts when we actually end up relocating into the treatment setting it's very difficult for us to recreate that same fishbowl. So many times we, not, we may not see the same dynamic as we might at home. When we start looking at things like higher level of care, depending upon which level we're talking about, we could be talking about some anywhere from a month to two months, four weeks to eight weeks or longer. When we talk about how awesome is it that in four to eight weeks we can radically change someone's life and, and restore functioning and, and you know kind of set them up for success, that's fantastic. On the front end of that, when you're looking at how in the world am I going to push pause on my life for four to eight weeks for not only my child, but myself, anyone else in the household, it's a, it's a much bigger ask and we don't always give that the credence or the respect that it probably deserves. So it certainly is a, an enormous barrier unique to this uh, setting. Increased financial hardship. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not even necessarily talking specifically about the cost of treatment, but again, when we relocate, transportation, lodging, food, um, you know, if there are some sort of school arrangements, if you're having to do care for other children who are in the household who may not be coming with, there are a lot of other things that come along with this above and beyond the simple cost of treatment itself, which is already difficult, um, particularly if you're not able to take the benefit of using insurance to pay for that. Something else to consider here that we'll, that we'll kind of close out these barriers with is that when we talk about intensive treatment, specifically, you know, if you think about inpatient care, it's 24 seven. Um, we're talking about, you know, medical or psychiatric stabilization. Residential care, we're still talking about living there effectively 24 hours, um, but even the programming itself occurs for a large chunk of the day, you know, five or seven days a week even at what we would consider to be less intensive levels of care uh, for our purposes, for PHP or IOP levels of care, um, you're still talking about enormous chunks of the day, three or six hours a day, five days a week is, a, is a, a not insignificant amount of time. So all of these are barriers that, that tend to be unique to stepping outside of the traditional outpatient lens. So when we think about how do we begin to address some of these barriers, um, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a different journey than you might be expecting. So when we, when we talk about team-based solutions, I'm not gonna tell you to use your right hand instead of your left hand or that how you, you know, make some sort of a change to your outfit. What I wanna do is, is think a little bit more organically about the setting itself. So we're gonna talk about three different characteristics of intensive treatment programming that really help us and set us up in a way where we're able to more effectively address some of the barriers we just talked about. The first has to do with the design of the facility itself. Um, so, so keep in mind some of these things you may have more or less control over in an outpatient setting. In an intensive setting, it's not easy to impact these things, but it is easier, I suspect, particularly when we're planning out the, the design of the facility itself. Specifically talking about the location of that facility and relations with other facilities in the area, we'll, we'll break each of these down, but just as an overview. The second characteristic is the setting itself, specifically once you walk through that door, what are you seeing? How is the floor plan laid out? How are we using the space that's available to us? What does it look like in terms of how we've decorated and furnished it? Um, and as the kids say these days, when they're not from the 70s, what's the vibe right, uh, that's going on? And then that third solution structure that we talk about is the structure of the program. So again, some of those, the, the more traditional questions, what's happening in treatment? When we say treatment, what does that look like? When is it occurring? How is it being delivered? To whom is it being delivered? And who's doing the delivering of that treatment itself? What does it mean when we say the treatment team? So if we break these down in the first, when we talk about the facility design, I wanna start with location. And again, keep in mind, this really speaks to rethinking who is on the treatment team itself. Um, again, if we're talking about the geographical uh, distance itself for relocation, again, you know, uh, it, not to go on a history of Rogers, but if, if you were to ask, certainly Dr. Halverson or even myself, I haven't been here as long, we can talk about kind of the journey of beginning to expand and grow across the country and the, the many advantages that's had for us. And one of the kind of the most relevant to today's discussion has been it, it allows us to provide care to people who were unable to geographically relocate to the original locations that we had. 
Again, some of these things you may have more control over than others when we're talking about in an outpatient setting, but they do bear consideration. If you're running an outpatient practice and it's going well and you're thinking about adding a second location, how do you begin to leverage that second location or multiple locations for that? Um, the second is that when you think about not only the, you know, the distance between them, but also where specifically are you thinking about locating that site? So when we, when we think about the ability, if you don't offer family services, but there are family providers in the area, how do you make sure that the location you're choosing is somewhere proximate or somewhere close to those providers? How, how can you take advantage of that? So, so again, kind of a, a little bit outside of the box of thinking before we ever even get to treatment, how do we begin to set ourselves up to succeed? In this, by the same token, when we talk about facility design, when we talk about relations, specifically, how do we increase the ability to access those family-specific providers? Not only are we talking about location, but we're also talking about establishing relationships. And some of those begin with students. So, uh, you know, I, despite what you may or, or may not think about this, when we talk about family providers, the same as with any other type of, of client-facing role or patient-facing role, they don't spring from grad school fully grown and, and suddenly competent. Um, would that that were the case, right? Um, we also talk about training and certification programs that you might be able to start or participate in, specifically anything from practicum to internship to you know, certification um, pathways that are open to us. And how do we establish those relationships with the therapist prep programs that are somewhere near your, um, your area of practice? Again, stepping away from the student piece and thinking about those, you know, incredibly competent, uh, well-versed and, and fully grown family providers, as it were, how do we establish, how can we establish collaborative relationships with those providers? Um, so, so again, a different way of thinking about this, but first, the first thing we talk about is really the facility design. When we talk about what it looks like to step through the front door, a couple of questions that I have for you. And I, I'm not gonna tell you, you know, where, where we got these pictures. One, Ruth was kind enough to find them for me, but two, I'm, again, I'm not supposed to sell our facility, but something I want you to think about is when you look at these two pictures that are two different locations, which of those appears to be geared more towards you for like a sense of inclusion and belonging versus the sense that you get when you walk through the door is the emphasis is upon compliance or potential consequences or, you know, awful movies that you may have seen in the past, right? Um, and also which of these facilitates more a sense of support and collaboration with the treatment team and a sense of growth. And then across the bottom there, something to think about is it isn't just us who steps through the front door. Um, when we think about the atmosphere that we try to foster in our treatment setting, when we think about you know, a place that's safe, collaborative, warm, supportive, where we get this work done and learn these skills and set ourselves up for a better life, what I picture in my mind when I think about that may and most likely does differ from what you may picture in your mind about that. So something else we have to keep in mind is, you know, which of these two settings, uh, not that these are the only two choices, which might be better received among patients and families and even some of the staff members that we hire based upon the different cultures and backgrounds from, from which they come? What's the message that's being given? So another couple here that I'll take a look at, and these really are waiting areas when we talk about uh, the treatment setting. And again, this, the same questions, but also something else to think about here is what are the assumptions that we make about our patients and families and staff in the choices that we make about how we furnish and design our settings? So when I think about a place that's safe, perhaps to me that means someplace that's close, there's a small room, it, it's more familial, we, we have the sense. What if that's not the case for you? What if what you want is when we talk about safe, that you know, I have clear lines of sight, everyone's not in my space, things like that. So I, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had about the assumptions that we make about this. Notice we haven't even gotten to the treatment itself yet. And what we're already talking about is where are we locating it? How are we designing it? What is the vibe when we walk through the door? When we move more into the treatment itself in terms of the program structure, I wanna revisit this idea of the fishbowl that we talked about. So specifically, um, how do we take a look at the materials and the activities that we have and begin to categorize them? Um, more specifically, categorize them for the individual who's being treated versus a, a category of materials and resources that are only meant for parents and caregivers. One, to support them. Two, to also facilitate that kind of that skill building piece that's necessary only for parents and caregivers. 
And then that third category, which is combined. And I don't just mean we don't know where else it fits, but what are the resources that we use specific to beginning to kind of build uh, a more adaptive and integrative relationship between families and, and the patients that we're talking about, the family members here. In terms of um, additional staff issues, right? What we wanna do is leverage what we, we lovingly refer to as the mass to practice effect. So specifically when we talk about things like dose rates, when we're talking about behavioral health and those higher levels of care, one of the things that works in our favor is we have this abundant amount of time. Um, it's a, it seems like a, an embarrassing luxury of how much time we have compared to an outpatient setting in which to do this work. And in that, much of that time is spent in practicing the skills that are being learned, which allows us to, to kind of close the gap and make things move more quickly than they would. What I will point out to you is that we are able to leverage this same effect when it comes to working on family skills as well. So if we're talking about you know, how, to, um, how to negotiate difficult conversations, how to deliver task demands, how to deliver consequences, positive or negative, not only can we go over the educational piece for that and the training that we would traditionally do, right there in the treatment setting, we have the opportunity to practice that skill again and again. And again, until we approach not only a base level of competency, but ideally be able to um, approach something that looks like automaticity for our parents and family members. So for those base skills, we, we might want large parent groups to kind of talk about and, and provide that support that's there. For some of the smaller skills that are more niche or, or only applicable to smaller groups of patients, again, we're able to break those parents up into smaller groups or dyads and, and work on those niche skills. Again, we have the luxury to be able to do this when we talk about the sheer number of patients we have coming into our facility. It's a little bit of a, a tougher ask when we're talking about an outpatient setting. When we talked about the long hours uh, that, that are endemic to higher levels of care here, we have to be more thoughtful and sensitive in terms of how we're scheduling those family-based um, elements. At the simplest level, we can think about time during the day where, you know, for some families, maybe morning works better for the family programming and afternoon just it isn't something that's going to work or, or is certainly isn't as easy. For other families, it may be the other way around where mornings are quite difficult, maybe due to other family members needs, things like that, but the afternoons are a little bit easier. If you have the ability, if you have the size, if you have the bench, so to speak, for that, to be able to set up a, a track A or a track B for something like that can be very helpful and useful. In terms of the length of stay itself, I think we can also step outside of the box when we start looking at things like when our parents and family members, although we certainly want them involved in care, when is it the most critical? And, and I would posit to you that when we, when we look at the findings, when we look at our experiences in delivering higher levels of care, that we can phase that family participation. So for the first week, for almost anyone coming through the door where possible, uh, I use the term mandatory, but you know we don't, we don't jack people's arms up behind their back or anything like that, but we certainly where possible would like to include families, certainly the most at the beginning, definitely some sort of a mid-stay touch point if possible, as it's indicated. And then during that last week, again, we come back to strongly encouraging bordering upon mandatory for family involvement. And again, what we're looking at here is what's the progress that's been made? What are the changes? What are the things we want to make sure really get across here? So those are some of the, the, the three different categories of solutions that we've really talked about. And um, now, as promised, I'm going to turn this over to the man of the hour, the man with the power, the man too sweet to be sour, Dr. Halverson. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Nadeau. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here um, to uh, to work with you guys on this on this important issue. You know, there's a couple of things that I wanted to cover before I got into the meat of the presentation that your conversation, uh, Josh, uh, brought up that I wanted to make sure that I that I that I um, hit. You know, one of the things, you know, we talk about family members involvement, I know uh, for your child and adolescent providers, you're thinking specifically about parents, and that's crucially important. And certainly in some of our programs, you know, you say you don't want to say mandate, Dr. Nado, but we certainly do mandate um, some, some parental involvement and having parents actually on, on site. Uh, but, you know, certainly a lot of my work has been with young adults uh, and uh, having parents uh, still involved is crucially important. Uh, at that age, um, when you can get the uh, patients to agree to it, that is, um, it's, it's crucially important. Uh, obviously, this includes spouses and significant others uh, moving forward uh, with, with your uh, adult uh, programs. 
Um, you know, the other thing you brought up, uh, length of stay, length of stay is really crucial for this. As you said, it does allow you to kind of stage your family interventions, so to speak, your family meetings uh, throughout treatment, which will obviously help you be uh, more successful. And, you know, we're going to talk about some medication stuff. And, and I know, uh, you know, when you have someone here from, from four to eight, for four to eight weeks, you know, you actually have that opportunity to see the medications um, improve and to deal, you know, real time with side effects. And, and, and we're going to talk about that. And, you know, another way to do these things um, are through formal uh, family sessions, but also in some of our programs, uh, we have, you know, particularly for the child and adolescent groups, uh, we have what we call parent university. Uh, we're also rolling that out to some of our adult programs, particularly our addiction programs, where we get uh, parents involved uh, in ways to uh, try to help with the psychoeducation. I think, you know, I'm going to talk about why this is important. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I know some of you get it. Um, some of you might not get it. Uh, but how, why this is uh, so important, I think the psychoeducation piece, um, allowing the treatment that you're giving, the excellent treatment that you're giving uh, to, to work uh, without getting uh, basically uh, countermanded uh, at home, uh, this is a, it's a very, very important and very uh, useful thing uh, for us to do. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, uh, Josh, that would be great. Okay, um, how does the patient benefit from family involvement? And even before I get um, into that, I want to say, how, you know, how do we benefit from family involvement? Um, I, I think at the end of the day, our goal is for our treatment that we're giving to be effective uh, and to and to uh, uh, not get countermanded at home. So uh, you know, we benefit by not only getting to know our our uh, families, we get to know our families, and I'll talk about our families get to know us. We get to know our families. We also get uh, a, a great opportunity um, to, again, to kind of see uh, dynamics uh, in, in real life. So it allows us to be more effective. It allows us to share, um, you know, oftentimes get more empathy for our patients, uh, for seeing uh, what they're dealing with, uh, but also, um, again, it allows us to see what's going on, uh, and it allows us to be more effective and, and better, better treaters. Uh, but the patient also definitely uh, benefits from family involvement. I think the first part is a better understanding um, of the parents uh, or of the family as, as well as the patient. Um, they can get a better sense uh, and better insight to what others in the house are thinking and feeling as you've experienced you know, families aren't talking about this stuff. Uh, there's not a great shared understanding of what's going on at home. And oftentimes being able to hear, I guess this would particularly uh, be more effective for your adolescents and, and your adults uh, getting better insight uh, to, to what other people's thoughts and feelings are uh, in, the in the house. Oftentimes that is communicated uh, at the house in a not very safe way and not very accepting way. So it has an opportunity uh, for there to be a better understanding of the, of the problems. Uh, the family dynamic, as I've discussed uh, before, uh, you're able, we're, everybody's able to get a better sense of what's going on. Now, in my experience, uh, the, the patient uh, does, uh, their experience is, is, is very valuable and um, it's hard to not uh, want to just completely support the patient uh, and, uh, and, and be there uh, for the patient. And that's an important part of what you can do in these family sessions. Oftentimes our patients are not uh, necessarily able to uh, stand up for themselves in an effective way, which really does uh, impact the way that the families uh, are able to understand uh, what's going on. And that's certainly something that we can do, but also again, with our own eyes, we can see behaviors, communications, emotional expressions, things that we can point out to our patients when we see uh, what's happening in real time that can be uh, uh, beneficial. And psychoeducation is, is really a, a huge piece. And, and for me, you know, my, my overall thesis is this is really what's most important with this is it gives us a better uh, sense and a better ability to be able to communicate uh, what the goals of treatment are, what the realistic outcomes are, and, uh, and how uh, folks are, are able to stay well. 
uh, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about, particularly uh, with our child and adolescent uh, patients are, are really looking at, you know, accommodation and, you know, reassurance and, um, and, you know, reinforcing behaviors. It gives us really an opportunity to teach families why or why that's helpful or why that's not helpful. Um, but it's, it's really a, a real life laboratory. This can happen again in family sessions. This can happen again in some of our programs where we have family members there uh, because of the age of the child uh, we have. And we have a lot of individual work that we do. We ask family members to sometimes be uh, in the room with the child. It gives us a, a, a great deal of real time, real life opportunity. Again, to not only see what's going on, uh, but to be able to support and, and educate uh, the, the, the uh, family members. As we talked about, that's the, the, next, uh, the next piece is the support. Um, I think reality checks are also helpful. Um, and you know, Josh had talked about, you know, we do some of these, uh, in some of this education individually, some of it in groups. Um, just as you can imagine, group therapy is, it can be extremely helpful and powerful by our patients seeing, boy, there are other people that are dealing uh, with what I'm dealing with. I'm not alone. Uh, maybe what works for them might work for me. That certainly happens uh, with, with parents also. Uh, parents are, are able to see that there uh, might be other people uh, that are dealing, this in a, dealing with this in a different way. And maybe it's more effective, uh, but it gives an opportunity uh, for them to uh, model, uh, to see good behavior modeled. Obviously, there is that equal opportunity to see not so good behavior modeled too, but that's uh, why uh, there's always uh, multiple, uh, at least one uh, trained or, or multiple therapists there. Um, again, so the, the patient uh, also, uh, this is a, a really concrete way. I know sometimes um, when I'm talking to patients, they, they don't feel they necessarily have family support. They don't feel that their family cares. And obviously the family being in the treatment room with them, working with the therapist is really concrete evidence uh, of that. And uh, we can help some of those kind of uh, catastrophic or automatic negative thoughts uh, with, again, just a, a reality check. And, and then finally, uh, it gives us this opportunity with the family to establish new routines prior to coming home. Now, it's important that the timing is important um, so that uh, you know, you're able to get some practice before you go home, but also it's crucially important for the family to know what to expect uh, when they get home um, and uh, that is so that they're able to support it and they're able to know how to not get in the way of the treatment plan that continues uh, even, even after discharge. And we do know that if you're able to establish those routines and family members are aware of those routines, there is definitely a decreased risk of relapse and an increased risk of generalization or those skills becoming, uh, becoming uh, more permanent. Uh, Dr. Nado, next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about medication management because this is, we chose to explore this at, at a little bit more depth because this is something that comes up uh, very often. And, and I will tell you more times than not, family members are really crucial uh, in, into this going well. Um, you know, patients oftentimes will come in on medications. You know, by definition, if they're coming into one of our higher level of care, one of our more intensive programs. Uh, they have tried other levels of care and it has not worked as well. Uh, their severity is usually of a moderate plus uh, level. Uh, so in general, uh, folks are coming in with medications. And just to kind of define what I'm calling a higher level of care, I think anything other than kind of standard outpatient uh, where you're one-on-one uh, -on -one with a therapist or a psychiatrist uh, for 15 to 60 minutes, uh, once a week or more um, is, is a higher level of care. Like for example, our programs are partial hospitalization programs are six hours a day, five days a week. Our intensive outpatient programs are three hours a day, five days a week, just to kind of give you a sense of, of what we're talking about. So yes, by the time uh, they come to us, uh, patients come in on medications and generally a plan. You know, unfortunately, uh, patients are oftentimes coming in with the thought that my medication's not working because uh, I'm not feeling well, and that's why I'm here. I'm here to try different medication or get off of medication or try this intensive uh, type of psychotherapy that we hear that you guys have 
Um, so there's generally uh, an idea of having something uh, going on with the meds. Now, uh, what oftentimes, will, what will happen uh, almost as much is that there have been some medication changes uh, by outpatient providers in the recent past. And, uh, you know, these medication changes can take several weeks uh, in order uh, to get some benefit. So oftentimes, uh, if people are struggling, they get the referral to an intensive program like us, medication changes are made. And then at some point, uh, the medication, the, the, the patient comes in and maybe there was a recent medication change, uh, or maybe there was a taper plan initiated uh, prior to coming in. Uh, so that, that happens. Um, you know, one of the pieces I think that's that's beneficial for us is that uh, all of our programs have a prescriber. So that really does help with that communication piece as we're gonna talk about in a little bit, communicating uh, over medication changes uh, can be very challenging um, uh, if you're not in the same office, if you're not in the same room uh, as uh, other, hopefully, the uh, heat that just kicked on in my office isn't uh, overwhelming uh, people, uh, but I'm sure, I guess I will hear if it does. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't stay on for very long. Uh, anyway, um, so our pro programs have, have providers. Now, I can imagine if your program does not, um, having, that, uh, having that communication and being able to work closely uh, with uh, the, the prescriber uh, when you're working with psychotherapy can be a, a bit of a challenge um, because it is quite a complex two-step uh, in order to do it right. Um, but uh, you know, we fortunately uh, have, have not uh, had that problem internally. I will say generally medication changes are needed. Uh, if they're coming to us, uh, by definition, uh, treatment has not uh, been going well and uh, oftentimes the patients want to try something different. Uh, now, there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, first, uh, most of our uh, evidence-based uh, treatment algorithms out there for our uh, primary psychiatric disorders show that for most people that are moderate level of severity and above, you want evidence-based psychotherapy, but you also want medications. There's a combination uh, that is generally the sweet spot. And um, from, uh, from a payer perspective, you know, we are a very payer-friendly uh, organization. Uh, payers will demand uh, that medications be used uh, and that there is that combination of medications and psychotherapies, as we'll talk about in the not too distant future, you know, certainly some of our anxiety programs, we have people coming in, hey, I just wanna do ERP, I don't wanna worry about medications. And you know, I always tell them that's, that, that's fine, um, but unfortunately insurance uh, might demand something different and uh, we could all have the discussion regarding the ethics of that and uh, whether that is, uh, the right thing to do or not, but ultimately uh, insurers are uh, going to pay for the treatment and they can decide to stop to pay for the treatment if they don't feel that what we're doing uh, is evidence-based. So to be honest, medication changes uh, are oftentimes uh, due to um, our treatment plan. Sometimes medication changes are uh, encouraged by a, uh, a reviewer, a physician reviewer who is looking for evidence-based uh, treatment. Um, and, uh, and the patient obviously plays a role in, in all of those, uh, but there is some uh, level of encouragement oftentimes with medication changes vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, payer relationships. And again, I, I think for the most part, uh, the payers are looking for evidence-based care and, um, and that you are uh, trying to get um, medications on board because that is what we know works best. Uh, but there's that's obviously something that we could spend a lot of time with at Q and A if we wanted to. The other piece I think that is important uh, is the time frames of programming vis-a-vis uh, -vis medication uh, effect onset. Uh, if you have taken care of patients that are on medications, you know this. Uh, it takes a little bit for there to be benefit. Uh, at least a couple few weeks. Uh, it's much shorter time frame for side effects, though. 
Uh, and uh, that's why, again, it's, it's very uh, helpful and important to have a uh, to have to be interacting with the patient on a regular basis. Uh, so if there are side effects, you're able to get on them right away. And that's frankly one of, of the reasons uh, why practicing in this environment is, is great because I have somebody, even though I'm seeing the patient a couple of times a week, uh, I have therapists that are interacting with them every day. So if uh, we don't have that, what happens is if I'm taking a medication or patients taking a medication, uh, they have side effects, um, oftentimes they'll just go off of the medication. If you didn't prepare them for those side effects, and if you don't have anybody asking them uh, for the side effects, um, they will, by the time they come to see you in your outpatient clinic three weeks later, they've been off the medication for two weeks. Uh, but here we have people that are interacting with them every day, asking them, how are things going? How are the medications? Are there any side effects? And then if there are issues, we could get the provider in the prescriber in their uh, lickety split to be able to answer those questions, uh, which I think is important. Um, the other though thing to, um, to understand is if we're talking about a length of stay, an average length of stay, which is somewhere between four and six weeks at our intensive programs, um, you're not going to know definitively with the medication uh, by the end of that time. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they'll start to see some benefit. If there are side effects, you can manage that, but you'll start to see some, some, some benefit. Uh, you might start to increase medications, uh, but with our medications that we use uh, at this time, um, it's still the window for improvement with medications is, is certainly uh, much wider than our treatment is, and I'll get a little bit more into that uh, later. It's also important to recognize uh, for, our, for, for those of you that provide uh, inpatient care, um, patients are self-administering meds. Uh, at this level of care, they do not come in and have the medication given to them by a nurse. Uh, we don't watch them take the medication. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they, uh, well, they will take the medications when they get up in the morning, when they go home uh, at night, or when they go to bed at night, and possibly sometime uh, during the day. Uh, so that is uh, different than more uh, intensive uh, programs uh, like inpatient. Uh, where we are actually seeing the patients uh, take the medications. But again, obviously having this opportunity and the time to be able to talk to the patients ab about the medications uh, is, is extremely, um, is a beneficial aspect of this level of care. Uh, Dr. Nadeau, next slide, please. And just to kind of give you a sense of, of medication management and kind of what we are seeing uh, at, um, at this level, at these levels of care, uh, we looked up some uh, data uh, that goes back. Uh, so how many of our patients have started a medication? Uh, Josh, can you bring up those numbers, please? Uh, taking a look at these other levels of care, just so you, again, get a sense of, of what we're talking about. So at our in intensive outpatient level of care, which is our least intensive level of care, uh, we are starting new medications on almost 88% of our patients. Uh, and that is um, a little bit uh, different uh, between community and internal. I would say the, the uh, reason uh, for the, uh, the reason for the discrepancy there is oftentimes people are coming in with medication plans uh, versus uh, internally uh, not as much. Our partial hospitalization program, uh, there's a smaller percentage of, of new uh, medications started. And again, you can see that difference between internal transfers and community admits. And then our residential level of care, which is Dr. Nadeau was saying is more of a 24 hour care, although the treatment isn't necessarily 24 hours because people do need to sleep. Um, and, you know, there is a large uh, percentage of medication changes. And again, I think that does also reflect on the, on the increased severity of, of what we're seeing uh, at residential. Would you please uh, go back, Dr. Nadeau? And then how about adjusting an existing medication? How often does that happen? Uh, Dr. Nado, could you please click onto that? Uh, so you've seen there's a new medication. Um, how often are we sticking with the same medication? As you see, this is actually much less than starting a new uh, medication. The choice oftentimes is to start a new medication. Uh, intensive outpatient, um, you're adjusting an existing medication 28% uh, of the time, 
partial hospitalization uh, almost 24% of the time. Uh, and uh, residential, um, you're continuing medications about uh, almost 37% uh, of the time. And just, just so you understand, I think you probably get this, but I'll point it out anyway. Now, patients are coming in on multiple medications. Um, so it certainly could be the same medication, same person, same patient getting a new medication, as well as having their existing medication um, adjusted. Uh, Dr. Nadeau, please uh, go to the next um, so we'll also now talk about patients uh, that will end an existing medication. And we're just again looking at intensive outpatient, PHP, and, and residential. Residential, uh, we almost everybody is ending a medication. Uh, PHP and IOP, certainly most people are finishing uh, an existing medication. Again, we just wanted to show you this, if you could go back. Josh, I just wanted to show you this information to kind of give you a sense of, of what's, what's happening and, and why, you know, this is a very common, it's, I'm sure it's common in your practice too, if you're a prescriber, it's very common to increase medicines or start medicines or, or uh, stop medicines. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a super important part of the treatment, uh, and we're bringing it up because family members can play a huge role in a positive and negative uh, way as far as this goes. So the takeaway from this data, again, is that this is a very common part of the treatment, is looking at the medications and changing the medications, uh, and it's, uh, it's an important uh, piece to get the family engaged in. This is I'll talk about. The family uh, is, uh, can be super helpful or uh, super, super not helpful uh, in this situation. You know, so we, uh, at, at this level of care, uh, our, our prescribers average between one to three uh, visits a week. Uh, I would say there would be more in partial hospitalization uh, versus, um, versus intensive outpatient. Uh, and, uh, you know, the importance of these visits is, you know, we have our, our providers have some opportunity uh, to do uh, psychotherapy and have some opportunity to support uh, what uh, the other members of the team uh, teams are doing. But uh, when you have this opportunity to be able to make sure uh, that you are able to talk to the medication, uh, talk regarding the medications uh, to about the patients or about medications to the patients, it gives you a great chance to make sure that they're taking the medications, that, that the medication uh, is going well, uh, and because uh, again, we know uh, that the medications are really, really crucial uh, to helping uh, with these uh, with these uh, disorders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then, as uh, Josh went through barriers, I'm going to talk a little bit about barriers uh, in this uh, higher level of care. Uh, what we see with medications uh, sometimes, and you know, anti medication. When I think anti medication, um, I it, it doesn't mean all of that. It's, it's just people that have some concern about, about medication, not necessarily that they are um, medication deniers or, or whatever the, the appropriate term would be right now. But people have had a lot of experiences, uh, positive and negative, uh, with medications that come into treatment. Uh, so it's really important uh, for us to be able to learn first, see where people are coming from, uh, and, and talking to their family and kind of learning where these beliefs come from. Oftentimes they come from families. Uh, so it's important to be able to have, have these discussions. Uh, as I'd mentioned before, we have people that come in, uh, you know, I've tried a lot of medications and they'll give you a list. They've tried a lot. Now the problem is, is you don't know if they were taking it every day. You don't know um, oftentimes if the dose uh, got to an effective uh, or, or uh a significant enough level, um, so you so you do have to do some some work in that ways. Uh, but oftentimes, when people come in with specific medication beliefs, oftentimes it's it's misunderstanding. Oftentimes, it's things that you can talk about, and uh, you know the environment that you're in, where you have someone that you can talk to, um, talk about the medications on a daily basis, uh, really does allow. Uh, people allow this to go a little bit uh, better. And there are certainly times where we have people, again, I will say this particularly are an anxiety 
our anxiety programs. Um, you know, ERP works extremely well uh, for OCD. Uh, and although for severe OCD, oftentimes we'll want to do uh, medications, um, this, this group of patients tends to also have problems with, with, with side effects and concerns about side effects. And, and we certainly can uh, sometimes wait uh, and see uh, if the uh, ERP uh, is sufficient uh, and works uh, for some period of time. Now, the concern with that is, is when you're first starting these treatments, um, that's the time where the anxiety is super high. And that's really the time where you want the benefit uh, of the medications. Uh, but, you know, you try to have some flexibility. You try to meet the patient uh, where they're at. Uh, and, um, and then you do the best you can with that. Uh, it's also important uh, for us to be in contact with the outpatient provider. As I said, sometimes they're going to come in with um, with a plan on what to do with the medications. And uh, we are able to, in a way that you guys aren't able to do, we're able to interact with people on a daily basis and make sure that the treatment plan is going well. And oftentimes that's gonna be appreciated uh, from the outpatient provider because we're able to take that plan and we're able to put it in, into place. Now that it is a challenge uh, as you guys can imagine, being the outpatient providers, it's it's sometimes very difficult to line up those schedules. Um, and uh, you know, by the time we talk to the outpatient provider, uh, generally the patient has let us know what the plan is. Sometimes the patient doesn't know what the plan is. Uh, so it is it's uh, it's uh, our best effort uh, to try to be on the same page as the outpatient provider. But unfortunately. Um, Oftentimes people do not have an outpatient provider and that's really, you know, they need to be referred to one at the time of discharge. Uh, sometimes the outpatient provider does not want to bring the patient back in. Uh, so we have to uh, make sure that we uh, hook them up with somebody uh, on the way out. Now there can also uh, be issues uh, with discharges uh, as we are going through medication changes. Uh, and sometimes uh, those are surprise, by definition, they're surprise discharges. And usually our surprise discharges are, are fueled uh, by, again, insurance not believing that there's enough progress or not believing that the, that or they are feeling that they've had sufficient treatment this, at this level of care. So they're ready to go down to the lower level of care. And again, there, the communication uh, between us and the outpatient uh, providers uh, is, is crucial. Uh, at that at that point. And um, it's also very useful to be able to talk to uh, families um, to make sure that some of these beliefs um, regarding med compliance and the anti-medication beliefs and experiences, uh, not only are we able to talk to the, to the patients about that, but obviously we're talking to the families about that too. And it gives us a better sense of how we can uh, best uh, set our uh, patients up uh, for success uh, by having a, um, again, a better understanding of what they're being discharged back into. And getting back to the psychoeducation piece, a lot of our interaction with family at this level of care um, allows us uh, to be able to speak to the family. And um, I would be lying to you if I said that everybody that we talked to uh, families and patients um, regarding medications wanted to take medications um, after they after they left, uh, and I could also uh, tell you I'd be lying if I said that everyone that said they were taking the medications when they were our program were taking medications. As you know, we don't really have any tracers or anything like that. But but again, this is um, the best that we can do. And and you know, you had said uh, uh, Josh before you had called it a luxury. And this is 100% a luxury. I mean, we have an opportunity. We have these folks in a, in, a, in a bank of rooms for six hours where we have an opportunity to try to answer questions. We have an opportunity to try to interact with family and again, best understand what's going on and, and attempt to make sure the family understands why we're doing what we're doing. Um, you know, family in general, and we'll get the solutions in a second, um, but, but family in general, uh, is, has been, I guess that's probably, I'll, I'll go, let's go to the next slide, Josh, Dr. Nato. Um, so for the team-based solutions, I'll, I'll, I'll get to what I was gonna say uh, when we get to the next, uh, the next set of uh, bullets. Um, what we can do at this higher level of care is we can talk about uh, medication education all of the time. 
Uh, it's certainly not the only thing that we talk about, um, but uh, there's a stigma to everything that we do. There's certainly a stigma to talking about medications. Uh, and uh, by making it kind of part of the treatment, part of what you're talking about every day, uh, we believe uh, that uh, makes it more likely that the patient is going to talk about the medication and be more open to it. Again, we can closely attend to the effects and side effects. And, and frankly, I think the side effects are, are more important uh, for us to be able to uh, monitor. Again, in my experience, I'm sure your experience is similar. Um, the people aren't going to stop the medications if they're working. Um, they're going to stop them if they have side effects. Uh, and um, a lot of the side effects that we are, are going to uh, see in medications are consistent across people, uh, diarrhea, weight gain, nausea, headaches. I mean, these are very common sexual side effects. Um, these are, uh, are common and um, oftentimes they can get better with, with different interactions. Uh, so rather than with, with different interventions that we can uh, push forward. So rather than having somebody stop, you know, letting uh, medication, letting them know, hey, you might, are you experiencing this? Okay, well, that's common for the first couple of days, that's gonna get better. Um, you know, giving people uh, some education and some opportunity to better understand uh, what's going on, I think is, is, is crucial and will help people take the medications, which again, we know that's this combination that is most likely to help people that are moderate to severely ill get better. So the medications are a huge, huge part of that. And again, our length of stay, uh, fortunately, um, you know, we have an, a large enough length of stay where we're able to at least get those side effects out of the way. Uh, we're possibly able to even adjust medications, increase medications, um, help with sleep, uh, do some other things. So we do have a long enough period of time uh, where we're able to uh, help people. And uh, as far as the uh, family involvement, you know, we can identify and correct incorrect beliefs uh, by parents or, or patients regarding meds. It gives us an opportunity to provide this psychoeducation. What I, though, have found more than not is, again, families are, um, nobody wants the patients to get better in general than families do. Uh, so if families are going to be huge allies uh, in, in this, you know, in, in all of our fights, I think, in general. You know, we try to certainly for dangerousness and suicidal ideation, uh, we certainly get our families involved. Uh, medications, uh, if patients aren't doing uh, what we recommend that they do, oftentimes uh, patients are going to be our, our, our families will be our biggest allies. Our families will be able to talk to our patients, uh, maybe in a way about uh, taking medications um, that can be uh, very beneficial. Uh, we can generate in, in role play uh, how the patient can more maybe effectively uh, interact with the outpatient provider. I think what we find more than anything uh, is that the patient doesn't feel empowered uh, in that relationship, doesn't ask questions, just stops the medication, you know, helping them get more uh, interactive with their outpatient provider in order for this to go uh, better in the future. Again, education regarding medication effects and side effects is a, is a common part of what our providers do uh, during this program. And again, establishing these new routines, it's very important that they do it while they're in the program, but even more important that they do it once they leave the program. So being able to uh, get that started while they're in the treatment, uh, we feel is a, is a great way to make sure uh, that they continue to do well after discharge. So I think uh, that is what I have. Um, and then we're gonna transition to q and I see Janet popped up. Yes, yes. hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, I guess it's now time to answer some questions. So just wanted to give you a refresher on that part. If you do have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat feature. We will try to answer as many questions as we can have left. Uh, we will combine similar questions if they were submitted. Please do not go to the question. Please send an email afterwards to the webinar, rbh.org, and we will follow up with you. So next I will answer a few questions that we have in the chat. I see a few of them on virtual uh, and telehealth. The first one, does virtual telehealth help alleviate at least the problem of getting family all together for a family session? So that's the first one on our virtual teletherapy. 
Josh, why don't you talk about the therapy, therapy piece and I'll talk about medications. Sure, it's a really good question. So the, um, as you've no doubt figured out, you know, with the advent of COVID, uh, suddenly we found ourselves doing things in a way that we were told was impossible before with virtual and that that's come with a lot of awesomeness and a lot of challenges. Um, so on the one hand, it is easier for us to access family members who might otherwise be unable to attend because they, they truly are unable to leave the area for any number of reasons. So in, <clears throat> excuse me, in that respect, yes, it is easier to access family members um, through that, uh, that modality. One of the, the things that has been a challenge about that has been that folks will rely upon that, that sort of the, oh, well, you know, thank goodness I don't have to push pause on the things that I'm doing here. I can just attend virtually. And what we will find is that similar to virtual care of individuals uh, as opposed to in-person care, it does work in, in terms of my experience with that and what we've seen is that it works, it doesn't necessarily have the same effect size and there are some skills for which it works really well and some skills for which it, it doesn't work nearly as well virtually as it does in person. And I think the same is true in terms of what we've seen with respect to, uh, to family work as well, in terms of being able to see um, the sort of that true emotional expression that we talk about, some of the nonverbals that are very difficult to see when you're judging someone in a box that's this large, you can't see what they're doing with their hands. Uh, you also can't see a lot of the body posture and, and sort of uh, physical spacing. It, it's very difficult to see certain things that normally would allow us to glean a great deal of information. So on the one hand, yes. Uh, on the other hand, not as much as we'd like, um, if only we could do like, I don't know, holograms or something uh, to get people there in person. It's probably a longer answer than we wanted. But. No, but I think that was a good answer. You covered most of what I wanted to say. I don't have anything specifically about medications, but again, it's just the engagement. Um, there's a different level of engagement uh, in person versus, versus virtual. And in a lot of times that's going to be fine. Um, but obviously, you know, I, I imagine, uh, you know, while we're doing this uh, conversation, I'm still, you know, checking emails and I'm still, you know, having to having to do all of this stuff. And I'm, you know, you're able to have the family engaged, but the level of engagement just isn't quite the same as as in person. And when we talk about the benefits of, you know, the the patient feeling heard and 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 feeling like um, the family is there for them, that again, I think is is more powerful uh, in person. Thank you, thank you. Can you talk a little bit, we talked about the family structure, but can you talk about who may be all involved in the family session? Who would we potentially include all in the family session at Rogers? Uh, from my standpoint on that, it, it, I'm gonna give the least satisfying answer ever, it depends. Um, and, and really what it depends upon is that there are so many different circumstances that would lead us to who needs what skills. Um, and, and unfortunately, as no doubt you've seen um, in your experiences, many times the child or the adult child, um, you know, is brought into our care and yet they may be the person in the family who needs the least help with building skills. Um, yes, they certainly need them, but not nearly as much as some of the other people in the family. By the same token, um, if, if what we see is that family work many times requires us to disrupt the family routine and perhaps someone has to relocate, we want to give careful consideration and, and try to get a sense for of the caregivers or people in the family who are present, who best, uh, you know, who would be the best candidate to, to ask to come and join in and in what capacity. By the same token, you know, are there perhaps family members where it would be contraindicated, which is the, the best term ever, uh, which it would be a really bad idea for us to have certain family members perhaps attend in person until we have certain skills in the way. I mean, I, that's, a, that's another lecture entirely, but it's a great question. Dr. Halverson might have more to add to that. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, I, you know, I think in, in general, uh, we try to let the, the, the patient drive that. Um, uh, and, and as we go along, if there are other people that we feel would be super helpful, super important, or we think that the patient is kind of purposefully, you know, maybe it's not contraindicated, but the patient does not want them there, but they're a huge part of the dynamic, then we'll, you know, work with the patient uh, to get it, to, to get, um, to get that person uh, into, into our, our sessions. But I, I think in general, we try to let the patient drive that. Uh, whomever the patient feels is family and is appropriate, uh, that is always, I think, the best place to start. Um, but again, that's part of the benefit of, 
of getting to know the patient, getting to know the issues, uh, we certainly will recommend there be other people invited uh, where where it need be. And those can be difficult conversations because obviously they're trying to cut this person out of this for a reason. And sometimes as you're saying, Josh, it's a good reason and we're gonna agree, uh, but sometimes it's it's counter therapeutic um, and you know they need to be engaged. So that is you know where we, again, you know, lead on our uh, hopefully reasonable therapeutic bond that we have uh, with, our, with our patients and, and families and, uh, you know, try to get who we need to be in there. Because a, a lot of times who the patient feels that we need isn't, uh, that we need in there, uh, isn't the whole picture. Great, Dr. Halverson, this is a question regarding um, withdrawal management and our medication for alcohol detox. What would you typically use and at what level? that we would use uh, for meds for alcohol detox at Rogers? Sure, um, that's an important uh, uh, important piece. I mean, specifically the alcohol, uh, there can be some uh, places where withdrawal uh, is too significant uh, for the outpatient level of care or the um, cravings, uh, you know, what we, we couldn't have people that have continued, that are continuing drinking um, at high levels uh, in our programs uh, with other people that are trying to stay sober. So I guess I'm saying some of that, if the withdrawal is pretty significant, some of that's going to be inpatient um, until people can get over that. Now, uh, when you said specifically alcohol, uh, but obviously we, we use um, the evidence-based treatments that we're aware of to manage that. We use naltrexone, uh, we use uh, acamprosate, um, as far as uh, helping to manage uh, some of those symptoms. Um, some people are also getting uh, injectable uh, naltrexone uh, in order to help them maintain their sobriety. But if you're, actually, if you're going through active withdrawal uh, and there's a, a worry that it could be medically complicated, uh, we're generally not gonna have that in an outpatient basis until they've been medically cleared uh, or un until, uh, you know, it would be very rare for us to have someone going through active withdrawal um, from, uh, from an alcohol perspective, obviously mild to moderate withdrawal, but I'm talking about if there's concern about seizure, if there's, um, you know, people are uncomfortable tonight, it can be an uncomfortable piece going through withdrawal, having them go, sitting in a treatment program, um, outpatient treatment program, sitting in a room, talking about uh, lots of different things and they're actively going through withdrawal oftentimes isn't helpful. Um, but, you know, we manage uh, cravings uh, all the time. Uh, we manage um, you know, different levels of, of people uh, in their use history. And, and we do do medication assisted treatment with evidence-based treatments. Thank you. Dr. Nardo, this is a question, it may be a little bit extending off to who may be involved in the family session, but just a little bit more about perhaps if you maybe have a family member that would you perhaps would not be advisable, you know, perhaps if they're part of the problem, maybe invalidating their environment, verbally abusive, or they maybe have poor boundaries, how would you handle that situation if you have any additional um, advice <laughs> in, in 90 that. seconds or less right <laughs> yes. no, uh, it, it's a good question and it's a relevant question i think one of the things that this comes back to is is what i'll tell our clinical staff many times um, and, I, and i think this i hope anyway this will ring true to a lot of the folks watching this who are well versed in family care there are two very different sets of skills we teach people with respect to interpersonal communications um, when you're dealing with a person who is in a relationship with someone else, whether we're talking parent-child or, you know, a, an intimate relationship, and for some reason the, the relationship is not working the way it should because people are either missing skills or haven't developed skills or using maladaptive skills, the skills we teach are, you know, kind of how do you get better at this, right? Like, how do you improve the nature of this relationship? When you're dealing with a relationship where um, let's say you have a family member or you're in an intimate relationship with someone who their interpersonal skills are just fine, but there's something quite toxic. Um, and I mean, without delving too much into like sociopathy, um, there's something truly kind of nasty going on there. The last thing in the world we want to do is try to get our patient to take on board the skills to get better at having a relationship with that person. And instead, the nature of the skills that we teach are instead how do you buffer against being in a relationship with someone like that in order to kind of get by and still get your needs met? And to borrow from the business model, how do we teach you to diversify your sources of 
or uh, positive reinforcement. In other words, how do you get those needs met interpersonally from people other than folks like that? And I think, so I, I told you all that to tell you this, when we think about things in that fashion, although at first we might not want that family member in the same room or involved in those sessions because we need to teach certain skills, as we begin to teach those skills to buffer against or to protect yourself against, um, you know, the personality styles or dynamics like that, it's also really important for us, as strange as it may sound, whether virtual or in person, to begin to include that person to make sure that the patient is able to or your client is able to um, show greater mastery of using those skills and to be able to adjust to the interpersonal dynamics. So sorry, I went over the 90 seconds, but again, there's a that's a semester long course right uh, right there in terms of what we do and it's difficult. Yeah, and I'm just going to add that people are going to make choices, and they're not always going to be the choices that we think they should make, or that we'd like them to make. And but really, there's still a whole lot that we can do to, you know, you, you call it diversifying. I mean, I, I think there's a lot that we can do to help them be more effective in that relationship, um, or again, to at least kind of understand uh, the the risks and and benefits. Thank you. Um, this is another question about medication. And I think you talked about strategies and helpful ways that family members can help. And this is a little bit more in regards to, you know, following up on medication. So if their follow-up is needed on medication, perhaps maybe the patient didn't receive their highest dose. Can you talk a little bit about what that follow-up would look like and the communication piece for when they perhaps are going with their outpatient provider and they maybe are done with their time at Rogers in regards to their programming? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about coming to Rogers, there's always a time that you're going to leave Rogers too. Um, and, you know, hopefully you've had a good experience. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to have uh, relationships with outpatient providers. And, and sometimes that's easy when they have an outpatient provider that they're established with and we've been having and we've been communicating with them um, throughout their hospitalization. So hopefully nothing is necessarily a surprise. Now, there might be times where discharge is a little bit more abrupt than what we uh, would hope that it would be. And, um, you know, we do have kind of discharge, uh, we do have discharge uh, paperwork uh, that hopefully uh, can be helpful with some of this and hopefully the communication piece um, to the provider, uh, outpatient provider, uh, assuming that that person is known uh, can be helpful. Uh, it's a piece that we continue to work on with our providers. It's, a, it's extremely important that handoff, uh, making sure that people are able to stay well. You know, there's always questions about refills and, and, and those types of things. And we have different protocols uh, in place to make sure that that uh, type of thing doesn't get dropped. But when we have someone who does not have um, an outpatient provider, or let's say they were going to their primary care doctor and, and they come to Rogers and now their medication regimen's a whole lot more complicated uh, than it was uh, before. So for people that do not have a provider, we certainly uh, make every attempt to hook them up uh, with an outpatient a treater. Now, it doesn't always make sense then for our providers and our program to reach out to talk to somebody who uh, this patient hasn't seen yet uh, or hasn't seen the patient. Uh, I think our outpatient providers probably would not want that uh, to happen. Uh, so our goal continues to be uh, to uh, make sure that it's as clear as possible in our documentation. We know that our documentation uh, is, is available to the family. It is available. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're sending discharge summaries and correct information to that provider uh, that we have it, that we have them hooked up with. Uh, sometimes there's going to be the primary care doctor that's going to play that intermediary. There are certainly some times where the primary care doctor has no interest in playing that intermediary. There are times where there isn't a primary care doctor. So there's a whole lot of different uh, ways to do this. But again, I think communicating uh, with, with the provider Providers is most important, making sure that there are adequate refills to get the patient to that appointment uh, is important. And um, that's, again, where family can be super helpful because you can talk to the patient about the plan. This is what we want to do with your medications. And this is where we're at. And we'll write the script so that you take this for this day and this for this day and this for this day. And maybe it's straightforward, but having uh, the family also engaged and understanding uh, what, what your plan is can really be crucial in helping you get to that outpatient appointment uh, without problem. Thank you. Given the aspects of treatment such as behavioral activation and exposure and response therapy may result in non-compliance. Maybe the patient may feel uncomfortable. Um, 
what are some educational strategies that the family you found helpful in the past, you know, this may be versus older or versus um, older, younger versus older patients, excuse me. Yeah, so I think for me, I'll, I'll jump in here first. I, I think a large part of what we do, particularly when we're dealing with the, the younger patients, as you mentioned, um, there is a skill uh, in terms of how do you give a test and answer your child that the that the child does not want to do, right? So, I mean, we don't frequently say things like, how much ice cream would you like for dessert, right? That's not usually a testament. Um, and and so kind of learning to deliver unpopular testaments to your child is, is an important skill. And so I think there's really nothing different um, about that, thank you. I think there's really nothing different when we're talking about things like engaging in treatment activities as well. And so when we think about including the family members in this, it's really important that they are able to see you model how to deliver those testaments to, to children, adolescents, or even young adults. And I'll point out that um, if you if you think that because you do couples counseling or, or family therapy that, that this isn't a usable skill to you, but like how many times have you tried to teach one person in a relationship how to deliver, you know, uh, either a testament, we don't call them that in couples, right? But, you know, when we're talking about how do you get your needs met, how do you express that you have a need and respectfully but supportively and firmly draw boundaries and establish them, there's no difference here. The, the only difference is in the age of the participants. So it's it's a critical skill. Another question, uh, would you recommend and does Rogers offer family or parent groups in order to provide additional education or support to family members while relatives are in treatment? You want me to, yeah. So we do have a family university and unfortunately in different sites, sometimes it's called different things. So you may hear it referred to as family university or caregiver university or, or parent university um, that we do offer while the, the patient is in treatment with us for the families who are able to be present, or again, with the advent of virtual, this is something that's been wonderful. Uh, it's usually seen as quite valuable and uh, one of the more memorable aspects of treatment many times for parents. Following discharge, we're, we're trying to get better at expanding our reach with this in terms of offering some sense of support. Um, and in some places we have seen what might best be called alumni groups. Uh, where parents get together and talk about challenges and wins and things like that, where we don't so much lead that group as we have someone who's offering the space and time and, and facilitates to make sure that it's a positive experience where folks are heard. And if they do need resources, that we're able to uh, try to provide those to them as, as possible. It, it's something that's still very small scale, even for us, but it is a very difficult thing, particularly when you're talking about families from all over the country where regulations, requirements, providers, and resources vary understandably by state. Dr. Albertson might have. Yeah, the post-discharge piece, I mean, I think you described what we do in treatment or what we try to do in treatment uh, well, and, and I think we're trying to do more of that. Uh, it really depends on the program, frankly. Um, Post discharge is, is difficult. Um, is as as you as you said, if you're not really doing the treatment, uh, it's hard to be responsible for the treatment that happens when people aren't your patient anymore. There's lots of regulatory, medical, legal uh, issues with that. I think generally what we do is we refer people uh, to local support groups, NAMI, um, and you know. Uh, the 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 kind of addiction rehab, uh, AA, uh, uh, Al-Anon types of types of uh, supports uh, because those are well established and some of those uh, some of those can be excellent and in some ways uh, having post discharge uh, is 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 really what our outpatient uh, you know what our outpatient partners uh, what what they're doing um, and in and in some ways it feels like it might be a little bit redundant. Uh, for us to offer that. Um, so I, I, that's, that's more challenging. I think what I would say in general is, is we refer people to community support groups that have existed in our communities for a long time. Uh, most of our communities have uh, lots of those groups um, and we are uh, sure to hook people up to those at the time of discharge. Great, thank you so much. This is all we have time for questions today. Remember, I, if I, we did not get to your question. Please feel free to send an email to webinars at rogersbh.org and we will follow up with you. Many thanks to Dr. Halverson and Dr. Nadeau for taking the time and sharing all your valuable insights. 
Before we conclude today's webinar, I'd ask our presenters to share some of these additional resources on the topics with our participants. There's a few that are on here. Um, you'll notice that they are suspiciously geared more towards the, the younger crowd. Um, part of that is due to the fact that it is very difficult sometimes to find resources at the adolescent and young adult stage. They are uh, a little bit harder to find. You will find things like the Adolescent Transition Program or ATP, many times it's called. Um, but there are some here in terms of uh, resources for the younger crowd, anything from uh, Dr. Ellie Ludwood's space program out of Yale, the Confident Parenting Program, and then you many times we'll hear the term PCIT, if you didn't know what it stands for, it's Parent-Child Interaction Therapy. Um, so th there are resources out there, they can be difficult to find, these are pretty good uh, sources, and each of them also offers a, a, a locator for people who offer these services near you. Yeah, and I'll just put another plug in for your local NAMI or Mental Health America groups. Um, they are really the experts in your area about where to find uh, other other types of supports that don't get quite to where they're clinically clinically uh, necessary or needed. Great, thank you so much for sharing all those resources. And uh, that just about wraps up today's webinar. Thank you so much. I wanna remind the participants that for those of you who met all the requirements today, in about 30 or so minutes, you're going to receive an email with a link and a personal dashboard on CE. Uh, cd-go.com that will you'll be able to access all the PDFs in the PowerPoint today, as well as a handout with a complete list of references. Uh, those of you that met the time requirement, you'll qualify for the CE credits. You'll need to complete the evaluation to download your CE to certificate for this event. If you have any questions about the follow-up email, please contact the support at ce-go.com. On behalf of Rogers, we look forward for you participating in our next um, <clears throat> webinars. Uh, we thank you so much. Uh, um, so we thank you <clears throat> uh, so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much and thank you for our presenters. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.